for week number four of the difference a day makes, our anchor verse is gonna be found in Galatians chapter six, verse nine. It's one of my favorite verses. This verse for me personally uh, is one of those stabilizers. This helps bring alignment to your walk with the Lord. It says, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time we will reap a harvest, this is the part, if we do not give up. Elbow the person next to you and say, don't give up. Come on, don't give up. If you're taking down notes, this weekend's sermon is titled, I'm called, comma, but... All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. God, give us ears to hear you. Give us a mind ready to understand. God, I thank you that as we position our hearts today in a posture to be learners, not to just go through the motions, not to just play church, but God, I pray today that you would give us a deposit, that we would walk out the same doors we walked in, marked by your presence. For those watching, joining us online, I pray, God, that you would reach us wherever they're watching from, here in the nation and around the world, in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. amen. So I'm a dad of four amazing kids. Brecken's 14, Finley is 12, my little Daphne's six, and Foxman is four. I'm the husband of one amazing woman. We're about to celebrate 19 years of marriage this July. And I'm married way out of my league. Like, people still think I Photoshop her in the pictures. They're like, is she real? <laughs> okay. And then we also have, I'm also, um, I'm not into cats so much. Uh, anytime I talk about cats, I get a handwritten letter from people. Uh, okay, anyways, I'll, I had a whole other thing I was gonna think of. Anyway, if you're a cat fan, wave at me. Okay, great. If you're a dog fan, wave at me. See, dogs, it's different. There's like, yeah, yeah, woo! Cat people are like, So I am the dad of a 50% golden retriever, 50% poodle, and 100% husky golden doodle because she likes to eat, amen. That is, uh, that is the makeup of our family. And so we have these four amazing kids and our firstborn is Brecken and we've got to experience all the firsts with him. Uh, the first round of diapers, the first steps, the first mama, because that was of course all four kids' first word. And so we've enjoyed all of it, uh, from pre-K to kindergarten, all the way up to fifth, sixth, seventh, and now eighth grade. Now, Brecken, he's at the top of his game. I mean, he's eighth grade. The fifth, sixth, and seventh graders are envious because he's at the top of his game. But I had to have a man-to-man -man conversation with him. This is one of the joys of being a parent is I've been able to coach him through the different seasons that he's in. And I said, hey, buddy, you're at the top of your game. He's like, Psh. Got the little middle school, middle schoolers are like jealous of his mustache. You know what I'm talking about. And I said, next year though, you're gonna be a freshman. And I could just hear it. I could hear it in the room. Some of y'all had flashbacks. The parachute pants and crunchy bangs. Come on. We need to bring the bangs back. Like, not just bangs. I mean like the, like the teased bangs, the big, okay, some of y'all had tight gentleman perms. Come on, how many, where's all the, how many of y'all had the flashback of the freshman year? So I'm telling Brecken, here's the thing about freshman year is you were at, you're at the top, but you're about to start at the bottom. And then you're gonna hit sophomore and junior, and then senior year, you're gonna be at the top again. You're gonna be at the top of your game. Freshmen are gonna be like, he's a senior. And then freshman year of college is about to start. And then you got your sophomore, your junior, your senior year, you're at the top again. And then you're gonna start at the very beginning of your new career, maybe internship. The thing about this is this is the process that a lot of us walk through. In the kingdom, oftentimes it works this way as well. There are different seasons that God brings you through. How many of y'all have felt like you've been at the top of your game and then God's like, hey, I want you to step into this new season. You're like, that seems like a demotion. Like, but what you don't realize is graduation, y'all, it's a celebration. But it is also an indication that there's a new beginning that's coming. And sometimes in the kingdom, we'll trade the bottom now, we'll say, listen, I, I gotta, Lord, can I reason with you? Here's the key. Never trade the bottom of the new season that God has placed you in that is ordained and anointed by him for the comfort of the top of the previous season. Because sometimes we can overstay the seasons. We can overstay those moments, and God's like, hey, I have so much more for you to step into. I have so many things I want to, uh, because I've called and purposed you to step out in. And you're like, yeah, but this is pretty comfortable over here. 
Comfort zones are just that, they're comfortable, but nothing ever grows there. And once you've reached that place, and I've explained to Brecken, like, buddy, you can't stay here. You can't be a 33-year-old eighth grader. That's weird. <laughs> you can't do that. Because there is an ebb and flow of seasons. Look at the person next to you say, it's all about seasons. Come on. It's all about seasons. And I'm learning, though, during my journey as a dad, because I'm called to fatherhood. I definitely don't have it all figured out, but I'm still working on my qualification. You know, we learned a lot with Brecken. We learned a lot with Finley and Daphne and Fox. And each day, if I pay attention, it's the same in the kingdom. If I pay attention, I'll learn something new. But I still wrestle with sleepless nights. I can't be everywhere and everything and have all the answers all the time. Some of you are like, that's Jackie. That's not you anyways. Like, <laughs> where's all the moms? And you're like, the husband, he does not know <laughs> much happening. Okay. But in my journey of learning... I'm not an inadequate parent, but I am human who's, I'm committed to grow. It's the same thing in the kingdom. As God brings us through these ebb and flow moments where he's called you and he wants to equip you and he wants to empower you, we should be growing every single day. But it's, it all comes back to intentionality. It all comes back to the free will side of are we in our word? Are we praying? Are we seeking wisdom? Uh, I love how Dr. Hagen last week talked about Joshua's life and how Joshua found him in the middle of a war. He found himself in the middle of this war that was all self-inflicted. And the enemy wanted to get in his head that God's not gonna answer your prayers here. And he finds himself in this position wondering if there's a way out. And he called for the sun to stand still, we ask God to literally pause the sun in the sky in Joshua 10 so that they can defeat the enemy so that years and generations to come, they won't be plagued by this moment. It's amazing how God will show up even in the midst of self-inflicted issues if we are determined and willing to get out of the way, surrender, and choose to grow. I don't know about you, but this year, I'm choosing to grow. More than ever, I'm choosing to grow as a husband, as a dad, as a leader. Thank you for 11 of you. are like, I'll choose to grow as well, I guess. This is, ugh. All right, so here's a question for you. What if you've been walking in discouragement because you've been confusing the calling with qualification? Because again, we all go through growing seasons. Because of this, there are seasons that we're at the top of our game. And then there are seasons where God says, hey, I'm gonna start you off at the bottom, but this is all on purpose to see you grow. But most of the time when God is asking us to step into a new season, again, we know this, he'll give you direction without all the details, so you kinda just end up here. I'm called, great, now what? This is the part where we start getting weary. Most of the time, this is where we wanna throw in the towel because the comfortability of the previous season seems so much better. So here, practically speaking, if you're called to be a doctor, you still have to go through med school. There's some significant training. Can we make some noise and show some love for all those that have committed their lives to the medical field? Everyone in the process of becoming nurses and doctors and surgeons. But did you hear that? The process of. Like, I'm excited that you're in training, but I'm not going to let you do surgery on me yet. I had a guy tell me last night, he's like, yeah, I actually want to be a dentist. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to let you do a root canal in the parking lot. A pair of pliers, like, hey, can I try it out on you? Like, no, there's a process of preparation that gets you to the point where you can be fully qualified and do what God has called you to do. But it doesn't mean you're not called. I think that's the misconception because we want to microwave everything. We want everything to be fast. We want everything to be instant. We want to be able to type it in and AI type out a whole essay report for us. No, we want things to be instant, but in the kingdom, there is a process of preparation. If you want to become a mechanic, you have to go through training, qualification. You want to become an engineer, training, and qualification. There is a process to becoming qualified. Come on, somebody say it out loud. There is a process to becoming qualified. So here's the deal. Why, when God calls us, do we disqualify ourselves as soon as it gets too hard? Like, God, you called me, but why is this so difficult? Here's what I want you to do. Come on, it's a crowd participation moment. Look at the person next to you. And say, I'm not where I'm supposed to be yet. Look at your second choice and say, but I will be. Come on, but I will be. I will be. B 
because I am in a process of preparation to be qualified. And some of y'all are like, yeah, this makes sense. I see it. I see your point. Y'all, but failure to recognize the season you're in can cost you. Failure to recognize the season that God currently has you in. That's why we say all the time, there's no wasted moments because the waiting season doesn't have to be a wasted season. That waiting season can actually be a significant, life-shaping, moldable moment where the, where the Lord can pour in and speak into you, pull some things out that should not be there. Because for some of us, if you don't recognize the season you're in, it could be it could cost you a future business, a future relationship, a profitable relationship. The Bible shows us how all throughout the word, failure to recognize a call and the moment actually costs people kingdoms. I wanna read today through 1 Samuel. It's one of my favorite stories, chapter 16. You have the prophet Samuel who approaches Jesse and begins to talk to him about uh, one of his sons becoming the new anointed king. But to set this text up, we have to recognize the context of where Israel was and what they were going through at the time. God had established Israel with the intention that you will be my people and I will be your God. That's found in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 22. His covenant with Israel was that they would follow him with all of their hearts and in return, he would reign over them and provide them with justice, protection, prosperity. Israel grew kind of weary and they started coveting their pagan neighbors and coveting what they had with their kings and they saw them serving tangible figures of power and authority. And this was in direct contrast to their all-powerful, unseen God. This was a pattern that the Israelites were facing. And truthfully, it's a pattern that we face as well in the, the day of age that we deal with now. Y'all, the spirit of the age we're in now is no different than the Bible days. Now, it's a little different because we have access so quick. I, I talk about this all the time. We can quickly access things. It's the same spirit. I've said this before. If you've never picked anything up, I want you to grab this from me today. There are no new demon factories. There's no new tricks and schemes of the enemy robbing us of our best life. No, no, no. You can go back to Ephesians 1 and see when Paul was writing from a prison in AD 60 and 61 to the church of Ephesus saying, hey, don't allow all the sexual immorality that's happening to get in. Don't let self-love and worship get in. Don't let the love of government get in over your love for God. Well, man, that sure does sound like 2023. Yeah. It's the same tricks of the enemy. How many times do we affirm that we serve the Lord but secretly, because this is what Israelites were doing, secretly we place value and security in tangible things. They're like, I do like that Gucci bag. I do. No, it's the same, same spirit of the age because the market's going to waver. Your pension may be in jeopardy. You may get a challenging report from the doctor. And all of these in the natural do cause great concern. But they are not our salvation. Right. We serve an invisible, all-powerful, ever-present God. And when we put our faith and our trust in him, he alone makes us secure. Somebody should give God praise right there. So for the Israelites, again, they've recognized and they've seen, man, the hand of God has moved so many times all throughout their history between the parting of the Red Sea to escape the oppression of the Egyptians to a cloud by day to protect them from the sun and a fire by night to keep them warm. God showed up in the middle of this dry place, provided water, gave them quail and manna every day. But again, in our humanity, like they did, they chose to only trust in what they could see in the moment. So we pick this moment up in 1 Samuel after the establishment of Israel's first king, which was never God's plan for the nation. And already we see this king, Saul, his heart strayed from the Lord. Saul strayed from his calling to lead Israel with character and integrity. And because of this, God said, no, 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 I need to intervene and replace him with a new king. So he goes to Samuel, who's a key prophet to the nation of Israel. He encounters God, and God gives him instruction to go forth and to anoint Saul's successor. This is where we're going to pick it up for Samuel 16. We're a Bible church. We're going to read through the Bible. It's not just stories and fun moments. Like, this is good. Watch this. Verse 1 through 13, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, 
since I have rejected him over king of Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. So Samuel's having this conversation with God and says, but God, how can I go? Because if Saul hears about it, he will surely kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. He arrived in Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Prophet Samuel said, yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. Come to the sacrifice with me. So then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Verse six, when they arrived, there's a lot of Bible, Bible context, but I need you to stay with me. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before me now. Verse seven, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at, at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Somebody say amen, that's good. Amen. amen. He looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab. These are strong names, y'all. If you're like, I'm gonna make a journal of like future names, Abinadab is pretty strong. Had him pass in front of Samuel. Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse had Shema pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen any of these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Jesse responds, there's the youngest. He's tending to the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. I'm sure they were just like, he said we can't sit down. Like, we just gotta stay standing the whole time. We're not gonna sit down until he arrives. He goes on and says, so he sent for him, had him brought in. He was glowing with health, had a fine appearance and handsome features. All the ladies were like, okay, David. <laughs> Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Verse 13, so Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went back to his hotel, the Ramada. It's the message translation. I just wanna make sure y'all were awake, okay. So I know a lot of you are hearing me say this. You're like, okay, I, it's a lot of context. Let me give you a little bit more framework. In Jesse's family, David, out of all the sons, was regarded as unimportant. So when prophet Samuel visited Jesse's home and all the older sons showed up and were on hand to meet him, David was tending to the sheep. He was in a process of preparation. David never took on Goliath until he took on the lion and the bear. Process of preparation. But in this moment, the difference this day made was the prophet Samuel comes to Jesse's home and anoints David. 13 years later is when he actually became king. Think about that. He's anointed. The brothers are like, whoa. And then it was like, okay. Bible theologians talk about how there was no immediate change, no significant change in David's pattern of living after this anointed moment. David, after he was anointed, he went and continued to tend the sheep. Even though David was called by God. Man, what a bold statement. That was the difference the day made, man. He's called by God, but there was still a long road to become king. He was called by God, but still had to walk out the process, the preparation that was needed in order to become who God had established him to be. If you consider Hope City your church, Consider me your pastor. I want to prophetically declare this over your life. Just in case you didn't know it, you are called. You can write that down. You can, you can make it personal. I am called. The difference that day makes, I am called by the Lord. David was approached by this great man of God. God began to shift things in his life. You are called by God. This is what the Bible says about you in Psalms 139, verses 13 through 18. It says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Some of you are like, that's her problem. That's the issue with my wife. She's marvelously complex. <laughs> Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter darkness, utter seclusion. 
as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before one single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I cannot even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand in Galveston. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Come on, that's good news. When I wake up every day, you're still with me. I love the quote by Mark Twain. He says, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. The day I was born and then the day that your why is established, that call, I've called you. Y'all realize there's a call, a purpose, and an assignment on every single one of you? That we're called to fulfill what God has established. Now, there is obedience, there is surrender, there is willingness because God's not a forcer. You're called. There is something that God uniquely has created you to fulfill on this earth. Maybe you feel stuck. Maybe you feel frustrated. Maybe you feel like, yeah, I get it, Daniel, but I'm, 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 I'm past my prime or I'm too young. Whichever way the pendulum swings, you are called. And one step, and this is our prayer this weekend, is that the Holy Spirit would overshadow you with peace and that you would walk out confident again in the calling. Come on, somebody. I love how Dr. Hagen tied how we live our lives in two different realms of time. The first one he talked about was Kronos, which is what time is it? That's calendar, that's time management, that's okay, I need to be 10 minutes early because my motto is 10 minutes early is on time, on time is late, five minutes late is unacceptable. I've joked about this, but Jackie will show up like 10 minutes later, like, baby, where were you? And she's wearing a shirt that says, sorry, I'm late, I didn't wanna be here. I'm like, did you wear this shirt on purpose? So there's Kronos, and then for Christians, as we walk out relationship with the Lord, there's something tied to purpose when it comes to time, and it's called Kairos, which means what is it time for? Like I wake up, I'm, I'm managed by time, I have a calendar, I keep an eye on time management, we're gonna get you guys out of here in plenty of time, but then there's this side of you when it comes to assignment and purpose in the call of God is, what is it time for? What is it time for me to do? Because I want to be more mindful of your agenda in my life, God, than my own. I want to be able to walk into a room and say, there you are, not here am I. I don't want to be so consumed that I miss an opportunity to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. I don't want to be so busy that I can't move my calendar around and say, what is it time for? It's time to serve. It's time to sow. It's time to show up and be faithful. I got one hand clap, and I'm good with it. What is it time for? So you're called by God, which leads me to number two. Write this down. Are you committed? Because you're called by God, but are you committed? Committed to what? Committed to godliness? Committed to righteousness? Committed to godly oversight? Accountability? Committed to integrity? Because we all love the called moment, but the waiting, the in-between, not quite yet, the not now season, will you still worship him in the not now season? Will you still trust him even when you can't fully track him? He anoints David. The prophet Samuel goes out of his way to show up to his dad Jesse's house. David was like, man, awesome. I don't have to deal with these sheep anymore. But it said there was no significant change in David's pattern of living. He said, thank you, sir. I got this oil on me now. I got to go deal with these sheep. Will you still trust him in the waiting? Let's catch this. Not now. If God says, hey, hey, I've called you, but not now. Not now doesn't mean not ever. And right now doesn't mean forever. I remember when Jackie was in the pattern of baby babies. I feel like we were changing 11 to 13 diapers a day. And then she's like, I'm gonna switch and do the cloth diapers. I'm like, Ugh. like I don't like all that. Mm -mm. Throw it out. I'm gonna do all that. And I remember the pattern of sleepless nights and wondering, dear Lord, is this going to be <laughs> forever? I can't make any meetings. I can't do this. I can't even get on a phone call. I haven't washed my face in days. Like, where's all the moms at? You know the pattern. You know what I'm talking about. But that pattern didn't last forever. All four kids are potty trained now. 
it's a different season we're in because right now, the season that God has you and he's called you, maybe he's saying not now or maybe he's saying not right now. Not right now doesn't mean forever. Later on, the life of David, we see him running from the very king that he is supposed to be anointed to replace. Saul basically puts a death threat out on David's life and we read in 1 Samuel chapter 24 that David declares, listen, even though Saul is after me, I'm not gonna touch God's anointed because David recognized that God establishes and removes leadership. It's all throughout the book of Daniel how God will establish leaders and he'll remove leaders. Now we look at David's life, we say, well done, David. That's incredibly honorable. Thanks for not retaliating against Saul. But consider this, David, even though he said, I'm not gonna touch God's anointed, David was also God's anointed. And he could have said, this is my chance. This is my shot. I bet on me. But instead, because of David's character and because of his integrity, he could have said, we're both anointed, but I'm, I'm God's neck. So Saul just needs to get out of the way. But David, David didn't have the mindset, I need to speed it up a little bit. But instead, he was a man of faith and honor. I'll say this again. <clears throat> there are certain things in life that if you rush it, you'll ruin it. And David could have rushed this entire moment. He's called by God. Saul's now after him. This is the man he's supposed to take over for. He could have had him killed. David could have had him assassinated. He could have gone on social media and character assassinated Paul, Saul. But instead, he said, listen, I trust the process knowing that if God's anointed me for the next, then I know that he will lead me to be who I'm supposed to be as king he knew if God's called me and I'm committed to the call, number three, if you're writing down notes, he's also qualified me for more. You're qualified, you're qualified for more. It's the process of preparation though. David, because he was a man of honor, recognized he couldn't microwave this moment. He couldn't try to force the moment. I said it a moment ago, if you rush it, you'll ruin it because there's great insight that comes from time spent in the presence of God, it's important to not try to rush the revelation of God. It's better to be in his presence than what God can do for you, what doors he can unlock for you. I bet there's so many times, and I can't back this theologically, but I bet there's so many times that God's like, oh, okay, you just wanted to spend time with me because you needed something. Okay, cool. Oh, you were only praying because you want me to help you pay your bills instead of just being with me because my presence is enough. Yes. And David discovered that in the calling and tending to the sheep and spending time developing his sonship relationship with God, he discovered it was enough and trusted the process that God establishes and removes leadership. Because of that, y'all, he was qualified for more. John 15, 16 says, you've not chosen me, I've chosen you. And I've appointed and placed and purposely planted you. Now, Paul's planted. Some of y'all feel buried, but you're not. You're actually planted. Both look the same, buried and planted. But buried, something that's buried is dead. Something that's planted is a seed. So some of you have felt buried, and God's like, no, 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 I have placed and purposely planted you. Now, let me flip the coin. Some of you are buried. You're not planted. You're buried because of self-inflicted things, decisions you've made, the cause and effect, the domino effect, the poor choices and things you've done. And you're like Dr. Hagen's message last week of Joshua over here like, this is all my fault. But thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God that he can pluck you up out of the ground where you were buried and replant you like a seed. Come on, somebody. Purposely and appoint you for such a time as this, that you would go and bear fruit, it says, and keep on bearing, that your fruit would remain and be lasting, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name as my representative, he may give you. This qualification is not where you end, but rather where you begin. So what does it look like to not just be qualified, but qualified for more? We see faithfulness in due season will reap a harvest. We read that in our anchor verse that we talked about up top in Galatians 6, 9, that if we don't grow weary and we don't throw in the town, quit, 
for such appointed time, we will reach a harvest of righteousness. Because qualification is not the purpose. Qualification for a purpose is the purpose. Because the harvest is not for storing, it's for sowing. The gift is not for hiding, it's for healing. The power is not for punishing, it's for providing. And the calling is the calling that's given is actually something that we can align with the heart of God to give away. We can give away this qualification. We can establish, because of what God has established in us, the opportunity to live open-handed and say, God, whatever you have for me, I'll just keep giving it away. I will step in front of someone's storm and point them to you. Because how many of y'all believe that there are people's lives connected to your purpose? Come on. I believe it. Because you're not just qualified, you're qualified, qualified for more. So you're called by God. So then the next question I ask is, are you committed? Are you committed to the process? However long it takes to get there, to that place of qualification, are you committed? And let me take it one step further. Are you submitted? Are you submitted? That's why I say here all the time at Hope City, you have to be in a posture, and when you're open-handed, you're in this posture where you allow God to align someone to pour into you. You are pouring into someone else. And then there are people, band of brothers and sisters around you that are standing with you. Are you submitted? Are you submitted to the process, to the call? Because David was called. David was appointed by someone, and ultimately anointed by God, but he had to walk out the process again, a preparation so that God could establish what he was supposed to become. Come on, shout out loud, I'm called by God. Come on. I'm committed, and I'm qualified for more. Come on, give God praise if you believe that today. I believe it. Would you close your eyes just for a moment? Some of you are in the room. Maybe you're watching online, one of our other locations, and you would say, Daniel, here's the truth. Man, I walk with the Lord, and I needed this reminder today that I'm called. The truth is, my commitment has been wavering. When it's gotten tough, I've struggled. But I truly believe that I have a purpose on my life. And I believe through the Word of God today it was revealed that I'm qualified for more. I believe that through the power of Christ, Christ on the cross and the resurrection, that there is hope and power and life more abundantly. And God is equipping me in my call to be an influence for him to others. So that was for the believer, those that walk with the Lord, but maybe you're in the room today and you'd say, Daniel, here's the truth, man, called by God, committed, Qualified for more, the truth is I don't know him as my savior. The qualification on its own that comes before anything else is made possible is when you call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse nine and 10, that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, he knits you together in your mom's womb. Maybe you've been running. Maybe you've been like, Daniel, the truth is, this whole calling and commitment thing and qualification, I don't know anything about that. The truth is, light will begin to shine on the dark areas of your life when you commit your life to Jesus. There's three areas I want you to recognize if you don't know him. Number one, recognize that you're being called. Today is not by chance or accident that you're here hearing this message, maybe watching it in the archives. Maybe you came across it on Facebook. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Today, hear these words, Jesus is calling you. He's not only called you, but he's calling you. So the question is, will you commit? Can you commit? Will you Commit your heart to him because his call, it requires a response to submit to his lordship over your life. Again, to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart because there's grace and there's mercy on the other side of surrender. And then when you recognize that he's been calling you and you take the step to commit your life, then you recognize, wow, he sees me, he loves me, and I'm qualified for more. Again, we're qualified not in our own strength, contribution, but because of his sacrifice, his choosing us, we're not just qualified, we're again qualified for more. Qualified for more that once you commit your life to Jesus, your family can encounter his love through you. Your friends would experience hope because of the Jesus that they met through you. Strongholds and addictions 
that have plagued generationally your family can be broken off because the grace of the Lord has covered you. God, today I thank you for everyone who's sensing that tug on their heart. Friendly reminder to those who walk with you that it's not too late. They're called, they're appointed, and ultimately they'll be anointed by you. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, across the whole room, across all of our campuses, watching online, maybe that tug on your heart, Jesus has been calling and you have felt it. You said something all throughout the service has been tugging on my heart. And today, Daniel, I wanna give my life to Jesus for the first time. Or maybe you're the second invitation. You would say, I wanna, re I wanna rededicate my life to Jesus. I, I fell away, Daniel. I know I'm called. Truth is, I've, I've wavered and ran from the commitment. And I've wavered and I've ran from my relationship with him. So today, I wanna to rededicate my life. When I count to three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand if you wanna give your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life, one, two, three. I wanna see your hand. I see you, my friend. I see you. I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you, I see you, I see you. I saw you back there. Come on, I saw seven hands say, you're talking about me today. We saw 11 just last night. All right, you can put your hands down. Say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, it's me. Today, I'm gonna to start living for you because living for me just isn't working. Thank you for giving your life for me on the cross, getting up out of the grave on the third day so that I could walk in freedom. I ask for your forgiveness for all my sins, all my struggles, and all my issues. From this moment on, I choose you as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord, in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody give God praise. Amen.